Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey everyone, welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have another really great guest this week. He is probably best known as an author, but he's also an extremely busy trainer and teacher. He's a bit of an adult improving expert, as I'm sure we will discuss. Uh, his first book was called Applying Logic in Chess. And as we record, um, avail- his newest book is already available in some places. It's being released um, uh, this week. It's called Chess Logic in Practice. Uh, International Master Eric Kislik, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So Eric, I mean, you've, you've, um, You've been making a name for yourself in the chess world. Um, your your book has a lot of interesting material. Your first book, I haven't gotten my hands on your newer book yet. So if you don't mind, I'd like to start by talking about applying logic in chess, and then after a bit, we can sort of uh, you can sort of uh, weave that together with your your newest book. Well, you know, one thing I wanted to say, uh, just kind of in passing, is that uh, when I called Cyrus Lockdawalla not long ago, he said, "Is this Ben Johnson?" I said, "It's Eric Kislik." He said, is this Ben? Because he said we have the same voice. Oh, interesting. Are, are we the same person talking right now? So anyway, that was just kind of a kind of an unusual thing. I just wanted to mention it as you as you introduce me. So I, I, I don't think I've met anybody with a, even a similar voice to me. So that's kind of funny. That's funny. But, I hope people can differentiate because I've listened to podcasts where the two guys have the same voice and it's actually kind of irritating because you, you don't know which one is is saying which so i'm I'm willing to take credit for any good points you make though eric so okay so excellent. fire away excellent well essentially when i when i considered writing the book applying logic in chess i thought well i i think i should contact john nunn and see what he says and i honestly didn't expect that there would even be a response i thought there might be something like well this book is already in production or or i don't know do you really have anything new to say and when I contacted him, he was so enthusiastic about it. I thought, wow, this is the, this is something that they really like. And this is something that I think can help a lot of people. And at least I thought from my perspective, I would have liked a clear framework for thinking about chess when I was 1600, 1700, 1800, just to, I mean, there's a lot of tension when you're thinking in a chess game. There's so many things running through your head. You don't know exactly what to focus on a lot of the time, especially if you don't have so much experience. And so I, I kind of wanted to take some of that burden and use some of my experience to help people with that. And one of the great things I was able to take advantage of, I guess you could call it, I was going to say crowdfunding, but just taking advantage of the fact that we have, we're so connected nowadays. And so when I, when I started writing the book, Applying Logic in Chess, I, I wanted to get as much feedback as I possibly could. And if anyone really majorly disagreed with anything, I, I really wanted to, to make sure I could address it and, and either concede the point to them or, or at least expand on what I'd written. And I was really surprised when I had, had emails that I sent to a bunch of GMs, a bunch of IMs, some FMs, some other players, a couple students. And it was a list of 25 points that I wanted to focus on. And I was really surprised by a lot of responses along the lines of, huh, I never quite thought of approaching it that way. Or, hmm, I think about it a little bit differently, but that makes a lot of sense. And I was expecting maybe one twenty-five fifty or 2,600 player to say, no, I think that's wrong. I think you should do this instead. But I, I was very surprised that that there was a lot of support. And it turns out that that Gambit and John Nunn really, really liked the idea of the project. And it, essentially, the idea was just that I would try to start from the simplest concepts, the simplest possible elements of chess, and try to build our way up to what I consider to be a, a pretty good, a pretty good basis for understanding chess. And it's really difficult to do that in a book, as I'm sure people who have tried to write or put together material. When you put together the chess material, it's, it's quite difficult because a lot of what happens, I mean, you often, you'll often you often read in the introduction to a book that I collected 300 examples and I've only been able to keep 80 of them because the computer refuted these, these other ones didn't quite meet the point that I was trying to make. And so there's a lot of that. There's a lot of uh, 
getting rid of filler material and things like that. And I really don't like to include filler material at all. So I was really happy that at least in the second book, uh, (laughs) there's almost zero fat in the book. It's basically like introduction to a concept and then we just power right through everything. And in the first book, in the book Applying Logic in Chess, I really tried to lay out things. And I was really fortunate that I had a connection just because of how connected the chess world is. I was really fortunate. I was so connected to people like Grandmaster Larry Kaufman. And he told me a lot of things that (laughs) I have to say, even hearing them as an IM, I thought to myself, huh, I've never heard that or even thought of that before. And I think the simple fact, I mean, why this happens to so many players is just that in a chess game, when you're analyzing your games, when you're preparing, there are just so many things to think about that we sometimes either have just never considered something or never focused on something. So there are just so many things that can cross your mind. I mean, one of the things, one of the things that, that Larry told me was that, um, well, I mean, actually one of the really probably the most interesting point that I thought that he made, which is lesser known was, was when he said that the rook pair has a little bit less value. Let's say, I don't want to say a quarter of a pawn, but a bit less, a bit less than, a quarter of a pawn. Essentially, it's a little bit hard to explain this without looking at a position, but the point I'm trying to make is imagine that you have, let's say you have a position with compensation. Let's say you have, you've sacrificed the exchange. Imagine that one side has the bishop pair and the other side has the rook, has the rook pair, has two pairs of rooks. Well, two rooks, one pair of rooks. Imagine this situation, the, the point being that the rooks have quite a bit of trouble playing against the two bishops and in general slightly trip over each other because they want to control a lot of the same squares. And I remember when when Larry was telling telling me about this and telling me how he tested it in Komodo, you know, millions of uh, <laughs> millions of games, it all kind of checked out. And I said, you know, that's a really interesting point. I, I don't even, you know, I, I, don't, I haven't read anything like that before. And so he he mentioned that to me. He mentioned things like, like uh, for example, the one of the most interesting points that he made as well was that the rook pawn has the least value, which makes a whole lot of sense because the rook pawn only controls one square, whereas every other a pawn on any other on any other file will control two. And so that's exactly why, for example, a takes b three. Imagine doubling your pawns with your a two pawn can actually make your pawn structure not only in some cases healthier, but also better and more effective. And when he told me that, I thought, you know, that does make a whole lot of sense. And so I was kind of trying to fit together all of these different things that I had come across. And even though Larry wrote um, the Kaufman repertoire in black and white, which I thought was a really, really good concept opening book, um, he didn't really go into detail on this. So he kind of said, have at it. <laughs> you can go ahead and uh, and and we'll be happy to uh, to flesh out any ideas that that you have or or if you have any problems or any tr- any trouble explaining anything, then then let me know and I'll help you flesh it out. And so I, I essentially what I what I started getting into was I started off with the piece values. And the reason why that's such a trip, tricky topic is because we usually just learn things like the, the knight is worth three, the bishop is worth three, the rook is worth five, the queen is worth, some people say nine, some people say ten. And you'll have a bunch of these situations. For example, you'll have a situation in which possibly you might have three minor pieces against the queen. Imagine that you, you thought of the queen as ten. In that case, you would think of the three minor pieces as worth nine, and you would go, oh, I'm losing a pawn. I'm losing a pawn of value by playing with the three minor pieces. And what you realize, I mean, what I realized that Larry had done with his very accurate, kind of well-proven, very well-calculated piece values is that he had provided a clear framework, which makes sense of a lot of confusing imbalances and confusing situations that really weren't that clear to me before. And you can see them at, a, at, at lower levels. A lot of people aren't quite sure of what happens in, in certain cases. I mean, one of the examples that I gave in applying logic in chess is I gave an example in which one side gives up a knight and a bishop for a rook and pawn. And by the way, first I'll mention what, what Larry gives as the most accurate piece values. And 
his his values for simplicity. I'm just going to round to half a pawn, just or I'm, I'm going to round to half a pawn or a quarter of a pawn. I was going to say half a pawn for for the knights and the bishops. But essentially, a pawn being worth one, a bishop being worth three point five five. But let's round it to three point five just for simplicity. A knight being worth three point four five. A rook being worth five and a quarter, which is very interesting, and which I hadn't heard anybody say before, Larry. And a queen being worth ten. So. What different conclusions do we can we figure out from that or, or are logically guaranteed from that? I mean, one of them is that, in general, two rooks are worth slightly more than a queen by his piece values. That would be 10.5 versus 10. And in, in, terms of, in terms of the three minor piece situation versus the queen, imagine those three minor pieces, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 10 and a half versus a queen, 10. And one of the additional points is that if you have the bishop pair, it's worth approximately half a pawn. So imagine a situation in which you have three minor pieces for the queen and you have the bishop pair. In that situation, you would have 11 versus 10. So in theory, you would be roughly up a pawn. And of course, these aren't exact fig figures. Of course, it depends on the exact position on the board. But it's surprisingly helpful in making sense of imbalances especially cases in which you've sacrificed material. In cases when you've sacrificed material, you will often have much more counterplay than you'd thought. So let's take a situation. I mean, a typical situation is something like, let's say you've sacrificed the exchange. So you've sacrificed the exchange, and let's say you got the bishop pair for it. So you sacrifice the exchange. So what have you given up? You've given up five and a quarter, and you're getting a bishop, 3.5. And let's say you're getting the bishop pair. So we're already at four. And let's imagine if you can get a pawn for it. Imagine that you get a pawn for it. Here you are at five, and you've given it up for five and a quarter. And so imagine that that um, the the opponent has the rook pair, which makes the rook worth worth slightly less than normal. So then you have a situation in which you've given up the bishop pair. I mean, sorry, you've you've gained the bishop pair by sacrificing the exchange for a pawn. But you actually are very, very close to full compensation. And imagine that you've also damaged the opponent's pawn structure. For example, giving them doubled and isolated pawns or an additional isolated pawn. Suddenly, by sacrificing the exchange for um, the bishop pair and a pawn and structural damage, you're probably slightly better already. So it's one of these ways of thinking about it which allows you to judge very difficult situations with compensation quite clearly. For me, this really, really helped clarify and put a framework around something which previously was kind of intuitive to me. I, I would say in the past when I, when I would look at positions, of course I was judging here we have excellent compensation. You know, I was, I was thinking along the lines of good positional compensation. We have a lot of activity. Let's say you, you have a Bishop pair that's quite strong, but this helps, this helps also make you uh, allow you to play sacrifices with more confidence. Mm -hmm. So, and imagine with, imagine with older piece values, you would think to yourself, well, I'm giving up a rook and I'm getting a bishop and pawn. So I'm giving up five and I'm getting four. But you can see, based on what I, what I explained before, you might actually be giving up, let's say, five, the, the bishop pair. Well, you're getting the bishop pair. You have a bishop and you have a pawn. And you are also playing against the rook pair, which makes the value go from, let's say, 5.25, five and a quarter to, to 5.1. So, well, roughly, th these are just approximates. But the point is that you're, you're dealing with a very similar amount of material suddenly. And if you have positional factors in your favor, you might actually be on top already or already have a better or much better position. So with these really complicated situations, there aren't that many great ways to really approach it and make sense of it. But by looking at it this way, I think it all seems very clear. And so one of the examples that I gave, one of the first examples I gave was in which people frequently give up a knight and bishop for a rook and pawn. And based on these piece values, the knight and bishop would be worth seven. And if you're giving them up for a rook and pawn, that would be a little bit more than six, six and a quarter. So you're essentially losing three quarters of a pawn. And a lot of people just kind of reflexively like to go knight g5, knight takes f7, give up the knight on f7. And what they're actually doing is they're losing a, a certain amount of material. 
usually more than half a pawn. And they don't they don't consciously realize that they're doing it simply because they don't have I mean, they don't have the accurate piece values and the right way of thinking about it to approach it. So I didn't mean to go on such a long rant about piece values, but it's certainly a really big topic. And it's why I started the book with that, because that's where we're starting from. We're starting from this point and we're trying to build out. So that's that was what I was thinking about. Yeah. And Eric, this was actually the first topic that I wanted to talk about, too, because I do think it kind of informs everything that we think about uh, in a chess position. And one thing I wondered, though, I agree with you that like a strong player like yourself, it probably seems somewhat intuitive, even for me, as I thought about it and sort of uh, wrap my my mind around these different piece values. It, it, it made sense to me as I thought of concrete examples. But I think for a lot of less experienced players, it could be really hard to reframe their thinking after all these years of thinking sort of in a static way of, uh, you know, knight worth three, bishop worth three, maybe even three and a half, so on and so forth. So do you have any practical advice for players who maybe f- feel like GM Larry Kaufman, the designer of Komodo and yourself, you've you've made some good points about how to think about this, but they don't know how to incorporate it into their own chess thinking? Well, that's a very good point. Um, well, I, I think, of course, one of the, the best ways to inform that type of thinking, of course, you have to look at a bunch of examples. And so if you can look at as many cases as possible of major peace imbalances and and look at these examples and make sense of them, it's very, very helpful. I mean, one of the things one of the first things that I came across that was was an example was a book that covered maybe 10, 15 exchange sacrifices for quality was the book Secrets of Modern Chess Strategy by John Watson. And I, I remember when I went through that, I started to go, huh. I can see why he's why they're sacrificing the exchange, what the compensation is, and suddenly a part of my game that didn't exist just appeared because I had 10 high quality examples that I could start to emulate. And I said, "Wow, he has he has some really good points there and I see where the compensation is coming from. And if you understand what the compensation consists of, you can do it with much more confidence." And so I think you will have to look at cases of compensation like this and and uh, try to analyze it. And fortunately, nowadays with computers, that one of the important skills that we have to develop as players is we have to develop uh, the ability to get useful information from the computer and make sense of positions. And one of the things is when you analyze positions with major peace imbalances and just really, really complicated cases of material, one of the one of the sections that I had in the book was on evaluating positions, and I tried to show very complicated cases, and that was intentionally meant to be difficult. So I, I tried to basically – the point I was getting at was basically to say I'm going to take the most complicated cases I can think of. So I actually asked 12600 GM, sent me an example, and I said, show me what you think are some of the most complicated cases. And I took a few of them, and I tried to explain them. And so that inherently makes it makes it difficult for me and difficult for the reader. But the point is that is that I want to show some of the simple cases and I also want to show the hard cases so we can see it all kind of in action. Chess logic, you know, in practice or in action. I didn't want to name the second book Chess Logic in Action just because John Watson already had a book Chess Strategy in Action. And I thought, no, I don't want to stop step on Watson's toes or anything. You know, I'll I'll go my own way and (laughs) have my own title. I don't want to. I don't want to do that. So, but I, I think a, I think a really important part is we have to see the practical examples. We have to get the experience ourselves. We have to get the experience of assessing positions like that and also being wrong. We have to we have to be humble in our own chess and go, okay, I, I'm going to try to take risks, judge these positions, maybe go for certain imbalances that I wouldn't have gone for before. But what's going to happen is after I play these complicated games with these crazy imbalances, I'm going to analyze them in the greatest depth I can that will allow me to understand those imbalances and the amount of compensation. And that can be with a coach, that can be with a computer, whatever you do that can allow you to to build up an understanding on what happened in those games. So I would say that your own chess games are kind of a window into your own chess understanding your own approach to chess. And so it's really important to have a very high level understanding of the games that you've played and the, the, the decisions you've made and how you would handle them the next time, because it's just really, really important. I would say with almost all of the decisions I made 
in, in tournament games, I very seriously reflected on the critical moments and I started to think to myself, well, how would I handle that next time? And and people might wonder, well, look, I, I see that you're suggesting to analyze your games in detail, answer a bunch of different questions that you consider to be logical questions, but how do I really apply that myself? Well, one of the things which I think is really crucial for me especially is I have to be able to figure out if I was to play this position next time, what logic would I be using at the board? What what kind of thinking would I be using in a practical game that would allow me to find the solution that, let's say, the computer gave or let's say that a coach gave? And I'll put it this way. If the computer suggests something and I really could never think of a way that I would ever play that move, I will not put it into my analysis because I'll go, OK, I tried I tried my hardest to understand this move. I, I tried to play out some moves. I tried to extend the variation to make more sense of it. And I still couldn't quite make sense of it. So for me, in, in my own analysis, I don't put anything in that I don't think makes sense according to how I understand chess and how I think about the game. So I, I think that's a very helpful thing because then your, your own analysis also reflects your understanding of the game. It also means that you're not including stuff that, that honestly you couldn't apply yourself. Because a lot of the time, unfortunately, that's, that's not such useful information for you. And a really hard part about chess is what do you do with all this information in front of you? We have so much at our fingertips. And a huge thing after you play your games is you have to make sense of, okay, first of all, information you might get from analyzing the game yourself or with a friend or with a coach. But also you have to make sense of, of what you see from the computer, but also from played games, whether those are correspondence games, whether those are grandmaster games or master level games, whichever ones. But you have to be able to basically get something useful from a large amount of information. And the thing that's hard about that is that there's so much at your fingertips. One typical example is, so I, I had a student who was playing black in a Ray Lopez. And they, they played pretty well. I played through the game and I thought, wow, they, their opponent played really solidly and, and um, really held a draw very comfortably with white. And so... What you could do in a game like that. So what happened was we analyzed the game. I didn't have any major improvements I could suggest, which is, of course, very frustrating. It's very frustrating when, you know, you, you're playing with black. You want to play for a win and your opponent is really solid and doesn't make any any outward mistakes. So what we're thinking in that situation is, well, what could I do to maybe um, imbalance the position or complicate the structure or set difficult problems as Kenneth Regan called it, nettlesomeness of uh, Magnus Carlsen, you know, you, you, you create these situations where your opponent is just going to be more likely to make mistakes. And so what happened was uh, we were going over the game. Uh, I, I couldn't come up with too many, just a couple of minor suggestions. We checked it with the computer and the computer also didn't really have any major suggestions. But then what happened was we checked the played games and we looked on move 12 for black and, oh, Magnus Carlsen won a game in 2017 in this variation. And we looked at it and we're like, oh, yeah, Carlsen played this beautifully. And we, you can just play exactly the plan that he played. And even though Carlsen's plan is 0.00 and the plan you played is 0.00, he played a better 0.00 that puts a ton of pressure on the opponent. So that's, you know, not all computer evaluations are the same. And a lot of what that comes down to is complexity and the difficulty of e. well, the difficulty to play the position or ease, ease of playability. And so that, that, was a, that was an interesting case of taking you, making use of the information we have available. Um, analyzing the game with your own understanding gives you, gave us a few things. The computer gave us a few things, but nothing great. And then suddenly we had a Magnus Carlsen game. We spotted the one game and we said, boom, we're going to play that next time. And that was that's a, that was a really satisfying thing. I know it's just an example of analyzing one game, but it it it's a, a good example of kind of a creative mini achievement, and kind of shows you the value of being thorough. Yeah. So, because I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just, I was just going to say that that when you go through, I mean, you go through every step of it, and we went through the first two steps, and we didn't get anywhere. Then we went through that last step and boom, we had the answer that we wanted. So that was really satisfying. Yeah. And I guess, I, as you say, it's a specific case, but um, something that 
it, there are broader lessons that we can take from it. And um, basically, it seems like um, in terms of reframing our thinking about the point values, there's just going to be some effort involved. But a related question I had for you, Eric, since, of course, we both do some chess teaching and a, a lot of our listeners um, probably do some chess teaching, whether in a professional or just like teaching friends sort of capacity. Um, when you're teaching a beginner, I'm sure you don't teach a lot of beginners, but if you were to teach someone brand new to chess, would you teach them these new point values? And how would you explain to them that everywhere else they go, they're going to be told these different point <laughs> values, but you have the new hot ones um, for them to understand? <laughs> Well, uh, that's a, that's an interesting question. Well, I, I will tell you one thing. And um, so I, I have taught a couple of players who were complete beginners. And what happened was I really focused on getting them familiar with a lot of different patterns and a lot of different useful ideas that they wouldn't have otherwise come across. So one example was I, I had a I had a lesson with a, a very young student who was about seven years old and had just played a little bit of chess. And when people t think about what are first principles, what what would be a first principle of positional play? And the first one, something that I've even been able to teach to beginners, which people might be a little bit shocked by, is improving the worst place piece. So I had a first lesson with with a seven year old kid who had, you know, played just a few weeks, and I, I showed them a position, and I just went around the board and looked at all the pieces, and I said, "Can you tell me what the worst place piece is here?" And we we looked at the board. And they identified the worst place piece. And I said, how could you how could you bring that piece into the game? And then they they not only identified what the worst place piece was, but how to bring it into the game. And I said, you know what? This seven year old kid who just started chess found Botvinnik's move that he played against Mikhail Tall in the world championship. You know, Tall misevaluated the position in this seven year old kid who just started chess found the move. So here we have a very good first principle to start with. And so one thing that I do is. I, I do, of course, the, a lot of the examples I have on this topic are quite difficult intentionally, but I do try to keep simpler examples in which there's clearly, there's really clearly one piece that's not in play and we think about how we can bring it in. And I did, uh, someone, someone approached me last year about a beginner course and I had never done that before, but I, I basically put together, I think, seven positions in which you have one really bad piece or just one piece which is totally not not in play, and the solution is we we bring it towards the center, we bring it into the game, and that was something that I was able to teach to beginning players. And I didn't get too much into I, I've never really gotten too much into the piece values, but what I do when I'm teaching somebody uh, like a new student is I always send them my chess fundamentals, and it's just a PDF that I made with a bunch of my thoughts on chess teaching and my philosophy of chess. And so they see the piece values there and they, they, they you know, maybe they might not um, know how to apply it. But if there are situations that come up, I, I will try to talk about cases in which you can sacrifice your queen for for very good compensation. And that's always a fun one. Or you can, you know, sacrifice the exchange for a lot of compensation. So I do try to at least introduce them to that to that. And if I show them an example, I might say something like, I know that this is a really complicated topic, but here are three or four similar exchange sacrifices and just send it to them later and just say, here, here are four or five examples. Um, please take a look at these. And I think that this will help reinforce some of the ideas we were talking about and, and see if they can make sense of it. And I found that a lot of players actually can really make sense of it. So, so there, there are certain things, there are certain things that I think are really, really difficult I mean, for example, if you're dealing with really complex calculations with a board full of pieces and a whole bunch of exchanges taking place, that's going to be very hard to visualize. And I accept that that's a really hard topic and uh, it's going to be very difficult to teach that, you know, below 1800 or so is very hard to teach that. But um, w with the simpler topics, I, I think we can talk it through and make sense of it. And what doesn't make sense, we, we try to figure out why it doesn't make sense and, and how we can go from there. So I really do think that that even with teaching almost beginners, there are a lot of things you can touch upon. And a, a big thing that I also touch upon with beginners is undefended pieces. Yeah. And actually, one thing which I found to be really funny, I was, I was coaching a seven-year-old kid and he said, LPDO, loose pieces drop yeah. off. And I said, who told you that? He said, someone at camp. And I said, hmm – Wow, they they know about John Nunn's LPDO, and and so I, I, well, one thing that I've noticed is that 
they've heard about loose pieces drop off. But sometimes when there are cases of, let's say, you plant carrying out some kind of tactical operation, which involves a double attack, and then, you know, you win an, you win an undefended piece. I, I try to show them the simplest possible cases I can of undefended pieces tactics, because if they can just pick off a piece in the middle game in the first 20 moves, they can win a lot of games with tactics exactly like that. So that's, that's a really big, that, that's a really big, I don't want to say first principle, but it's one of the first things tactically. I mentioned positionally improving the worst place piece, I think is the, the best starting point. I haven't found anything better than that. Right. And it's not really a topic that I've heard discussed too much, kind of first principles of positional play, first principles of tactical play. But with tactics, undefended pieces, absolutely. And with with positional play, improving the worst place piece. And that all of that kind of fits together with compensation and piece values and things like that and, and understanding those types of things. So I, I found that if you can fit them all together, it works out quite well. You touch a little bit of this, a little bit of this. And and I try to I try to direct them where they can get more information on this. One one book that had a had a quite good section on loose pieces was John Spielman's um, chess puzzle book. That had a pretty good. It had about maybe twenty five exercises. And so I have so I made a similar PDF with totally different positions, and it has twenty five exercises that I sent sent to players. And you know my my goal is just that that they can really spend time thinking about an important topic that they just otherwise might not have thought about. They might not have focused on. And when they spend, you know, let's say they spend two hours focusing on this one concept, then when they're playing at the board, they have a pretty good handle on that concept. They have a pretty good handle on the concept of improving the worst place piece and, and bad pieces in general. They have a pretty good handle on undefended pieces. And so that gives them a, a very good starting point, a very good foundation and I feel like in my own chess, I want to say I didn't have that foundation. It was kind of like I was picking little points here or there. Okay, John Nunn said this, and Dvoretsky said this, and I have a little little bit here, a little bit there, and I tried to do the best job I could in fitting that all together. And that was what I was try. That's what I was really hoping to do with the first two books, and and so I've really made an effort to. Um, to put things into clear structure whenever I could. In any case, when I thought that we could have structured thinking that would help us not necessarily get, not necessarily have the exact solution, but at least think about the topic. And then we can use those tools to help us at the board. So that's that's a big starting point for me. So Eric, I'm still not sure if I should teach beginners the new point values right at the beginning. That because I know they like you work with so many uh, adult improvers, which we'll get to in a second, and strong players. But do you think teaching a class who's brand new to chess, teaching them how the rook moves, the pawn moves, do you think we should incorporate the new point values? Do you think we should just avoid the topic at the beginning because realistically, it's so much more complicated than that? That's a really that's a really good question. Yeah, I mean, I I tend to prefer keeping things as simple as possible. So yeah, that that's a really tough question, and I think I would say I would avoid the topic, mainly just just because I, I mean I would being me, I probably would t- talk about it a little bit anyway, um, and just try to show some interesting examples, show some cases of it. I would really try to make it so that I would show as many examples as possible so they would have as many patterns to, uh, and as many high quality examples to rely on. But yeah, I, I would definitely try to focus on the simpler things first. And, and I maybe would would try to focus on that a little bit later. So so you could say that in applying logic and chess, it wasn't for absolute beginners in that sense. But, um, you know, I'd assume that that people had had been around in chess a little bit, at least before they, uh, before they encountered the book. So as, and of course the later material in the book was much more difficult than that. So, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely not showing that to the kids I teach for the most part. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's great stuff, but yeah, they're not the right audience. So Eric, moving on from a topic that may be of interest to some listeners, but something I know is of interest to many is adult improvement. And we have a question from friend and supporter of the podcast, Peter Newhall. Um, and Peter writes in to ask, he says, Eric, your book is very thought provoking, so it's hard to narrow down the questions to ask. So I'll just go with these. At what point should one stop analyzing a game and move on to other training tasks? 
And what percentage of time should be spent playing games, analyzing games, and on chess training? And if scheduling long OTB games is not possible for an extended period of time, can playing uh, action games online be a substitute? If so, what percentage of chess time should be spent on playing them? And I think this is feeding off of, uh, in your book, you talk about the extreme importance of actually playing competitive games. Yes, yes. Well, I, I think a, a big mistake that a lot of people make and one that I made, and I think is a, a common problem for perfectionists overall, is going, you know, I just don't feel my openings are quite right. I don't want to play. And honestly, people said, why were you emphasizing the importance of playing for three full pages? Isn't that excessive? And that was something that Christopher Chabri thought was really important to really, really hammer that in. And and uh, I've noticed that it's about 30 or 40 percent of people who contact me who have exactly that problem. They think, oh, I'm not quite ready to play or I don't know about my repertoire. I don't know. And and one of the I think one of the best choices that um, some parents contacted me. I had somebody contact me earlier this year. They said, mm -hmm. they said, my son is the number two 10 year old in the world. He's looking for guidance and he'd like to train with you a couple hours per week. And we've been following the advice in your book of playing literally as much as possible. So we're going to have him play three or four tournament games per week. He's going to go to you. He's going to analyze the games and he's going to spend the rest of the time studying or playing blitz online. And I thought that sounds fantastic. So if you have that possibility, of course, you should try to do that if you have that possibility. I think for most adult players, we just don't have that possibility. I haven't played a tournament in five years. And the reason is just because I'm, I'm doing something chess related seven or eight hours per day, sometimes nine or 10. So I'm just doing chess all day. I do, and even when I would try to squeeze in a Sunday league game, I would have to reschedule three or four things for that day. I'm just running from point A to point B. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, it's really hard to fit in the time for me to, to play. And I'm sure for a lot of adults, especially who are working 40 hours per week, it's a very difficult thing. One thing that I would say um, is, so there was a time when I was, there were, there was a period when I was working for 40 hours per week and I was trying to get in as much chess as possible. And you might wonder, well, what were you doing during that time? How were you able to combine working with playing? That sounds very difficult to do. So what I did was I would work 40 hours and when I, I had a little bit of space on the weekends, and so if I had a weekend tournament I could play, let's say four or five games, I would go and play every single one that I could. And I would analyze those games in as much detail as I could to build up as much understanding as I possibly could. Tried to get familiar with all the openings I was playing, tried to have a nice kind of compact repertoire. Uh, I understood all of the end games that I played. I looked up every end game that I seriously messed up in an end game resource or reference book. And I really tried to go very seriously into as much long time control chess as I, as I possibly could and uh, analyzing those games as carefully as I could. And if you really want to power through big topics, there are certain topics in chess that I really think you should go all out on. And one, th one of the things that I talk about in applying logic in chess is I talk about differentiating between temporary study and long term study. And by temporary study, I'm kind of referring to things in which I believe that you can really max it out. And I don't mean that you can never improve in that area after that. I mean that with very serious and pointed study for a certain period of time, you can really expand in that area and hit enough diminishing returns that you don't benefit that much afterwards. And, and you might be wondering what I mean by that. So let me give you a concrete example. Concrete example was... When I was about 2100, I, I was uh, trying to move my way up, and I thought, you know, I really need to work on my calculation. And I made a plan of taking basically the hardest calculation books that I could find. So the, the books I took were um, I used Perfector Chess and Imagination in Chess. And here was my very simple goal. My very simple goal was to do three tactics per day, put them up, set them up on a real board, set up a real clock for 10 minutes and have a notebook. And when I was done with each problem, write in my full solution. And so what I did was I was holding myself accountable. I was keeping myself more honest, which I thought was very good for my own development. So basically what I did with that was I spent a full year 
basically focusing on very serious calculation at least 30 minutes a day for a full year. And what that meant is I had gone through a thousand problems, probably more because I didn't I didn't only stop at three sometimes. Sometimes I would do four, five, six. But my goal was to do at least three a day. So I had this goal of doing three very difficult tactics per day. And in the end, after I had after I had gone through this, you could call it a calculation course that I created for myself, which was very simple, as you can see, just three very difficult tactics per day that really stretched the limits of my calculation. After I did that for a full year, it was kind of like, well, the one thousand and first example that I study now is much less beneficial to me than the 20th example that I did. And the reason for that is what I was doing was I was developing my thought process for how I work through very complicated positions. Uh, and, and so I think a really important distinction, which I haven't seen anybody clearly lay it out, but a really important distinction that I see with tactics is looking at it from two sides. You have A, your raw calculating ability, how well you you calculate these types of positions. And that that was what I was focusing on. I basically said, here are a thousand positions and I'm just going to power through these and and I'm going to really work on my, my raw calculating ability from those 1,000 positions. And the other side of it, can you guess what it is? It's pattern recognition. The next thing is just powering through tons and tons and tons and tons of patterns. And there were kind of folk stories about how many positions, how many games Kramnik played through per day that people said like 4,000. I mean, that's excessive. But people were saying that he was going through hundreds of games per day. I think he said something like 400. And he, he would, of course, he was mostly looking for, for opening ideas. And this, this was a while ago. This was when he was world champion. And people were asking, how does the world champion study chess? And one of the things he was doing was he was scanning for ideas kind of like what I was talking about when you're using the computer and when you're and when you're going through games you're kind of mining for information you have all this information at your fingertips and you're like okay I'm trying to take a little bit useful a little bit that's useful from here and a little bit that's useful from here and what Kramnik and also what Carlson do well what Kramnik did when he was world champion what Carlson does now is they do some pretty extreme mining they're going through so many games and they're like, do, 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 do. okay, this is useful. All right, this is useful. And just taking those things with them. And I've even seen cases of, well, <laughs> I don't know if this was just a joke, but but Carlson did say, yeah, I was following an under nine Norwegian girls team. And and I, I saw this girl play this really nice move. And I think I'm going to play it. It's right. like, okay, the world champions learning from eight-year-olds rated 900. You know, that, that I mean, okay, that's excessive. But um I, I, you know, there are stories like that and, and people like to exaggerate and, and play it out even more, but, but there's definitely some truth to that. And I recently saw a case, my student played a, a 1700 player in, in the Netherlands and, and they played a really, really nice opening idea as black in the London system. And, and I looked it up and I said, aha, this player is probably coached by a Dutch IM or GM who plays the same line. Cause I saw GM Queepers and one other guy had played this once in 2017, once in 2018. It was basically an almost unknown line. And then here are the 1700 players playing this great line. So great moves and great opening ideas and concepts can really be played at basically any level. So essentially, we're doing a lot of mining. And, and the th here's the thing. Here's the thing with, with the pattern recognition side of it. Most people don't really know, well, what do you do with that? And by the way, almost nobody suggests doing this besides me, but the whole point of it is priorities. We're prioritizing our time. So I know a guy who lives across the street and he has about 3,000 chess books. He has multiple bookcases full of books. And I would go over there and he has so many of these Chababalo books. And I'm like, how many books does this guy write? But anyway, he has so many of them. And I'm like, all right, is this like the ninth or 10th or 11th? And, and they're good tactics books. But I just don't have time to solve them. I, I, I simply I don't know who has the time to go through every single one of the new the new books that comes out. I kind of wish he produced like a best hits or something or like, you know, best undefended pieces, best mating attacks. I don't know, just something something so that I would go, ah, OK, that's the one I'm going to get. But um, anyway, I, I would go through and what I would do is I would uh, flip through every single exercise in the book, look at the solution and then I would go, does this make logical sense to me? Do I understand why this tactic worked? What about this tactic actually worked? For example, what was the weakness that enabled the tactic to work? Because one thing that I talk about is that 
is that tactics only exist because of weakness. I think, is, was it a weak king? Was it a weak back rank? Was it an undefended piece? Was it a trapped piece? And what I do with that, what, I mean, again, we're trying to, we're trying to come away with something useful from very complicated examples and, and make use of complicated information. And so what I would do is I, I would go through a bunch of these tactics and I would go, oh yeah, okay, this is the one where there's a trapped piece and you trap the queen with, with this little sequence. And then I can go back, I can go back two weeks later and go, oh yeah, yeah, that's the one with the trapped piece. And I'm remembering it based on concepts. I'm not just trying to hope that I can figure it out again the next time. So I'm really trying to attach everything to concepts that you can remember. And it makes it much easier for me when I remember the logic of the tactic, I'm much more likely to remember the solution to the tactic. So what that means is, is because I understand the things that the, especially the examples that I really like, I have something like 3000 instructive examples that I've made myself and I I have on my computer. And if somebody drilled me on these at random and asked me what the solution was, I could tell you what the answer is to 2,950 plus of those. And it's because I remember why I saved it, what was memorable about it, and what was the key weakness or what was the key idea? What was the key concept? And if you attach your your grasp of, let's say, tactics, like tactical examples to what was the key weakness? What was memorable about this? If you think about it that way, you go, oh, yeah, okay, this is the one with the with the really cool undefended piece sweeping double attack, you know, things like that. And, and so it's kind of like I have a I have a best hits, my best hits of undefended pieces, my best hits of trapped pieces. I have a um, trapped queen database, which has 400 examples. It'll probably turn into some kind of ebook or something just because I think I think a lot of players would would like to see that just for the pure patterns, just boom, 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 pattern, 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 pattern. And it's something that we just don't see. And I, I haven't seen much of it. I think I saw a chapter on trapped queens in, in one tactics book from 2007, and it was just kind of a couple pages. So a lot of these things, we really need to hit the patterns hard. And I think a lot of people don't know what to do in that regard. And so I'm hoping that I can help some people with that. And so the usual advice is, you know, don't do not skimp on this, take it very seriously, but I just don't have time to go through 15 new tactics books every year. So I'll go, I'll go to the guy's apartment. I'll, I'll sit on the couch and I'll basically go, all right, this one makes sense to me. Oh, that's a beautiful tactic. That's a beautiful tactic. And I'm just picking up patterns, pattern, 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 you know? So, so you're looking at the answers to be clear. Yes. In, in, in uh, with a lot of them, I'm, I'm skimming through the book and I would say I'm, I don't know. Let's say if I'm doing th- if I'm skimming through 300, I'm probably solving, let's say, 40 of them right away, maybe stopping on five of them and then looking up the rest. Yeah, something like that. I'm solving, let's say, 40, 40 or 50 out of 300 and looking up the rest and going, oh, and, and you know what I do? Let's say I look at one that I think is a really difficult move. I, I stop and I go, hmm, what would the logic that I would need to – to be thinking at the board to find that move. And I'm not going to stop until I have that answer. So basically going back to the question, the question that was asked is when do you stop on these things with something like that, with something like a tactic, if I understand exactly what I would need to think to be able to play it at the board, that's fantastic. But I want to go back to, to game analysis because that was really kind of what the question was about. I mean, that was one of the elements of the question. It was kind of a three part question, but Basically, uh, what I would say about game analysis, I want to understand the key thing. So uh, I'm thinking about, all right, basically the questions that I had in applying logic in chess. Who won the opening battle and why? I want to understand. So if I'm playing white, did I get a slight advantage or have good chances for a slight advantage? If my opening idea was totally neutralized, first of all, I want to understand why. That builds up my opening, that builds up my understanding of the opening. But second of all, I want to be able to go back and find some way to improve. And if I have literally zero way to improve, then I consider that a dead end. And I talked about that just maybe in half a page in in the book. When when you've reached a dead end and you basically go, well, I have a published game in this variation. They fully equalized. I don't have anything at all. The position's not more pleasant for me. I probably need to deviate earlier. And that's that's kind of when you encounter a dead end. But for the most part, yeah, I'm basically going through those types of things. Who won the opening battle and why? I do want to clearly understand why was the game won or lost, won, lost, or drawn. 
And I want to have a clear, simple explanation for it. For example, you might say something like, well, the Mikhail Tall's attack worked because he had a much greater concentration of force on a weak focal point in the opponent's king, uh, in, in the opponent's camp. So let's say he was attacking their king and he had four pieces against one or two. Even though he was down a rook, he overpowered their king and he won the game. So we have to work our way backwards and go, okay, what could Black have done to have avoided either the collapse of the focal point or being dominated in the case of concentration of force, too many pieces and not enough defenders? So you work your way backwards logically and go, okay, here's a moment where I could possibly improve. Here's a moment where I could possibly improve. And that's how you try to try to work your way backwards and think about that even without a computer or anything, just, just trying to figure it out on your own. So that's one big thing I always try to try to understand. And of course, I always want to focus on what are the key moments of the game, for example, exchanges or a critical moment in development. I mean, one thing which I talk about, which I think is a really important and understated point, is let's say you're playing white and the opponent has an exposed king and they have they're one tempo away, let's say, from castling and fully equalizing. If you're on move with white, you have one tempo to make something happen or or you do not get an advantage. So in that tempo, you in that one move you have available, you have to really try to make something happen. And that comes up pretty often. I mean, I don't know what, what uh, percentage I'd put on it, but maybe 20% of the time. That's a pretty big thing that comes up where you really want to turn it, you really want to try to consider all of your concrete possibilities that would set serious problems for the opponent. So that's a big thing with with critical moments. We also want to think about, for example, when when an attack is at its height, when there's a lot of pawn tension, these things can can be very likely cases that we want to look at very closely. We want to think about, all right, why what were the largest errors that were made? What about the positional errors? And like I said, big possible changes in pawn structure are important to look at, and they might not even be pointed out by the computer. And that's why we need to that's why I like having a clear framework to it because I'm 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 priming myself. I'm forcing myself to think about it without I mean, so I'm not forgetting to do this every time since I'm since I'm focusing on this every single time. It's one of those things in which if we if we don't have a framework, we we might miss out on something very useful and important that we would catch this way. So that's that's why I'm trying to be really complete about it. But I do want to give one piece of advice if going back to the possibility of playing because I was emphasizing the importance of playing, absolutely, and what to do with analyzing those games. So what I would say is if you had clear answers to all of those questions that I that I mentioned, you clearly understand why did the opening go your way, you clearly understand why the result was what it was, you clearly understand what were the key moments and how you would handle them next time, you, you clearly understand how did the exchanges shape up, would you change the structure next time? If you have a good handle on all those questions, there are some pretty strong diminishing returns, and you might not want to spend another hour on the game. You're basically like, I answered everything of top priority here, so everything else is of much less importance. So that would be the kind of thing. I would want to focus on the absolute key things and then move on. And I'm really trying to focus on these things from the perspective of Time efficiency, priority, I mean, we just don't have a lot of time to waste, so we have to be pretty quick with these things. So going back to the question about, just I'll finish this, going back to the question about um, playing, like let's say, let's say like many adults, you don't have the possibility to play this much. You don't have the possibility of, let's say, you know, a, a 13-year-old kid who's on summer break, for instance. You don't have the possibility to play that much. What I think is a good minimum, I mean, what I would do kind of as a minimum is I would say, all right, well, I'll start off the day maybe with some tactics, maybe maybe with one puzzle rush to get things started and try to play one 30-minute game per day. And so my, my student, Ed Lattimore, he, does, he plays one 30-minute game every day, and he just kind of – he does a little bit of tactics, a little bit of playing, and he's always staying sharp and applying things. It's kind of like his mind is always thinking about chess a little bit every day. And so he's kind of expanding on the concepts and the frameworks that he's been building up. And that's that makes it so that every day he's getting stronger in chess. Every single day he's building up his knowledge. So there isn't a day wasted in which he's he's not becoming a better player. So I, I think in his case, it's again, it's important to really be disciplined about that because if you get, I mean, even just one 30-minute game per day on chess.com, so 
I think he he was he was something like fourteen hundred on chess.com maybe about uh, two months ago, and now he's seventeen hundred. He's he's really shot up by by taking this really really seriously, and um, you know maybe two hundred points, two hundred fifty. I'm not sure exactly, but he he's really been taking that the whole thing very seriously. And if you do take it seriously like that, and you provide a framework to everything you're doing, you try to be as absolutely efficient as possible. And as I call it, be as logical as possible about all those topics, you're going to see definite results. So that's th- th- this would be my minimum. Like I said, you start off with some kind of puzzle rush type thing. You get one 30 minute game in per day. And like I did when I was studying, I would try to study four pages per day from a book. And these are my three bare minimums. If you don't have the possibility of playing a real tournament, let's say you can't play a real tournament for a whole month. So a whole month, you can't play any chess. That's what I would do. Okay, I would say, that's all right, good, that's good actionable I, I, advice. And for I, those I who don't, three, yeah, yeah. And for those who don't know, Ed Lattimore, he's a well-known writer and boxer, and he's been featured in Chess Life recently in American Chess Magazine. So his career is outside of chess, but he's been he's been showing some nice improvement and had some nice things to say about the work you're doing with him on Twitter. So I, he's had to say it on Twitter. Um, <laughs> So just just to clarify a bit more, and I do think that gives a good framework for someone who might have 10 hours a week or something like that. And you mentioned in the book, a heavy emphasis on playing. So I think that would be one of the take homes. And of course, analyzing the games. And for listeners who are trying to catch all of that advice and all the questions you should ask yourself um, after a game, uh, that's in Eric's book. So you can... Um, you can pick up the book and it gives you a list of six questions that you can go through uh, to analyze your games. Um, yeah, it's and, ch- chapter nine of the book. Yeah. And speaking of books, of course, Eric, you're, you're somewhat famously well read. Um, you talk in the book about how uh, you're largely self-taught and you decided to teach yourself primarily through um, games collections of uh, 2,600 yeah. plus players. Yeah. Um, and you, you, again, mentioned this in the book. But our listeners are always hungry for book recommendations and the perspective from stronger players. So with those four pages of books that our adult improvers are doing per day, which which, which are some some favorites of yours that they could study? Well, um, wh- one thing I would say, by the way, is, uh, you know, it was a it was a bumpy road trying to trying to improve as a player and. And essentially, uh, what happened in my in my development is actually it was kind of a kind of strange. But I, uh, well, you know, it's 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 really unfortunate to have to mention this. But there was a guy who he passed away, but he was kind of known as somebody who threw games and to to sandbag. And I, I happened to play this guy like three times when I was just starting out, and it gave me an inflated rating. And it's kind of like people were telling me about it, like reported to the thing. And you don't even know what to do in that kind of it's it's a very weird. It's a very awkward situation. And I was just new to chess. I don't even know what this guy's doing. And, you know, it's 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 really sad when those things happen. And the the whole thing was just really um, it's really disappointing when that type of thing happens. But basically what what happened was um, when I when I was when I was just developing a passion for chess I was um, I, I was went to my dad's college reunion and I played in a tournament there and I just kind of fell in love with chess at that time. And I, I decided, you know what, I'm going to go to the bookstore and see as many figure out as many good chess books as I can find chess by Laszlo Polgar. And basically what I did was I, I and I really tried to I couldn't power through the chess with Laszlo Polgar book. You know, that's a huge book. But there were books like Winning, uh, Winning Chess Tactics by Sirawan that as a beginning player, I actually read that book in four days. I just was like, boom, boom, boom. OK, I get this. I get this. And I, I just tried to power through those types of those types of books. And I think the complete book of chess strategy, with, which I read by by Silman, I think I read that book in less than a week as well. So basically what happened was I had a huge amount of book knowledge and I went to my first tournament and I, I happened to, you know, uh, have have some good breaks. And I initially got a rating of like 1900. And that was way, way exaggerated. I was probably playing about 1500. So, of course, it feels good on your ego when you're like, yay, I'm almost an expert. But, um, you know, so basically what happened was that all the time after that, you're trying to build up to to what your rating is. And I dropped, I don't know, 150 points or something. But basically what happened was I played chess for 10 months and I had a total of 10 months of chess and I came back. 
Well, I, I played 10 months of chess and I quit chess cold turkey. Didn't look at a chess position for over two years. And I came back to chess when I was 18 years old with less than a year of chess playing. So um, in most people's opinion, I think they would call that a, you know, some people don't like to call that a beginner, but usually 18 months ish is kind of beginner to intermediate when you're starting to switch. So I was kind of fortunate that I had such a fast development in that regard. But what happened was when I was 18, I came back to chess and there were people who were who were big on ICC and FICS. And they're like, come back to chess. We miss you. We want to have you back in chess. And I was like, you know, I'm, I, don't, I don't think I want to come back. I, I, I'm doing other things now. I, I, I don't think I want to come back to chess. And I went back and my online ratings were 1550. And I was like, all right, well, here's the starting point. And uh, I, I was in college and I basically thought, well, the only book I have here is Kramnik's Best Games. So I, I studied the book from cover to cover three times. And I said, you know what? Uh, I'm going to try to make a run at this. And, and I didn't even think I was going to make a run. I just thought this is really fun. And I love studying his games, so I'm just going to play, and I'm going to see if I can keep improving. And when you keep – it's kind of like you just keep feeling that enjoyment of going up. It's just kind of like a rush, like I'm, I'm still improving, still improving, still improving, still improving. And then you just keep building on what you've been doing. You keep working harder and harder. You stay determined, and you keep focusing like that. And so basically what happened was, um, you know, I, I was at that time when I came back – came back to chess at age 18, I was probably working on chess really whenever I could. And then when I was, when I was working 40 hours a week, I would only get to do about two or three hours of chess per day. I was basically, what I was doing then was I was studying chess two or three hours per day. Um, and then on weekends, when I had time to play in tournaments, I would play in tournaments. And so that was how I was splitting up my time. I was honestly just mostly studying from books or analyzing my games during the week and then playing on the weekends. And that was kind of how I was trying to trying to do it, but you know, it's 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 really difficult as a as an adult improver without without clear guidance. So basically, what I and I, you know, you probably read that article by uh, by Dana McKenzie. Um, so I, I met him in a tournament, and I had no money to get home. And you know, I know you probably shouldn't do that, but uh, I, I was so desperate to play that I was determined, and I would go and play anywhere without enough money to come home. And then I would just hope I could find a way to come home. And I only did that at a few tournaments because I had played less than 50. I played less than 50 tournament games and for less than one year um, before age 18. And when I came back at 18, I was unfortunately didn't have much money. So I didn't have a coach, uh, didn't couldn't afford many books either. And when I was going to play in these in these events, um, sometimes like that one was in Reno and fortunately, he drove me home and we had a long, you know, 10 uh, hour chat about chess. And he, you know, uh, the thing is, there are different philosophies. There are many different philosophies. I know that that there is a Russian school. There's a Hungarian school. There's a Ukrainian school, which is a little different from the Russian school. I'll put it this way. The Hungarian school that they teach here is very, very effective. It's it's different from what I do. But um, Peter Lukacs and Laszlo Hazai are the two most successful trainers in chess history in terms of grandmasters produced from beginner to grandmaster. There's nobody who's even close. And it, it's unbelievable how many GMs – there's a list of, of how many that were, that were Lukacs students. I, I want to say it's like 25 from beginner to grandmaster. You know, people take people who are 2,200 and turn them into a grandmaster. There's really nobody who touches these guys. And and by the way, that's not to um, to pump them up too much or anything. Uh, they, you know, the actual uh, work produced by Lukacs isn't really that well known. It's just kind of normal stuff that shows up in Informator. But the point that I'm making actually is it's mostly a consistency and longevity thing. It's kind of like you have these eight-year-old kids. They come to a GM or an IM. Uh, Hazai is an IM. And – they come to these players and they have a system, they have a set of openings that they're teaching them, they have a clear idea of this is the path you're going to follow and we'll turn you into a GM. And that's a very ambitious approach, but that's exactly what these guys do. And I, I've known some of the guys like, like Peter Prohaska. Uh, he was a good friend of mine. I was with him at a bunch of tournaments. Uh, great guy. I think he's maybe 26, 30 or so. But he had kind of, he had a really a, a really nice, well worked out 
smooth repertoire that he was developing for 10, 15 years. So he's, you know, he comes into chess with his GM repertoire, learning great patterns of play, good positional understanding from, from the age of a very young kid. And so he basically never develops any bad habits. And, you know, if somebody has that kind of possibility, that's a, that's a very special thing. So, you know, and I think I, I wanted to mention that just because I don't think almost anybody knows about this. This is pretty much unknown. And I only know this because I live in Hungary. And so I know all these players and I see all this. And, and you know, this is a crazy city to live in. I was just I, I was walking outside yesterday and there's an IM who just, you know, was right in front of my apartment complex. And we just go outside and talk for two hours about chess. And in a city where you have over 50 grand masters in a small space and 100 international masters, it's just a crazy chess hub with so much going on. So, you know, that that's kind of why there's so much chess running through my brain at all times. I'm not only doing seven, eight, nine hours a day, but I go out on the street and the chess doesn't stop on the street. There's like some IM or GM on the street. So it, it, it's a crazy thing going on. But really the way that I see it, the way that I see it, it's not that these guys are like they have the best method in the, in the world or anything like that. It's just consistency. It's that they, they have players who have good habits, good patterns that they're building on, good understanding they're building on, and they do it for 10 to 15 years. And if you do that for a really long time, you keep improving consistently for 15 years, it's kind of hard to not have good results. So I'm, I, I think that that is a part that, unfortunately, we just don't have in the U.S. because it's so spaced out. It's not the fault of the U.S. It's just that they're lucky here that everything's in one place in Budapest. So they have everything right here in this hub, and you have all these kids going to these guys and just gradually improving. And obviously not all of the players that go to them become so good, but it was amazing the, the, the players that they produced. And many of them didn't become 2700s, but, but I would say maybe five or six became 2600s. So that's, that's, a, that's a really amazing achievement. And you know, too bad that they didn't um, publish something like in Hungarian, like a clear, like a clear manual or method. But the thing is, probably if they actually wrote the book, they might not have anything that special to say per se. It would just be kind of like the, the fact that they're doing something, they're doing quality work consistently for ten years, and you know that has to have very good results. So it's it's I I really emphasize the the consistency in chess and. That's what I tried to do when I when I came back to chess when I was 18. I just thought, you know what, I want to I want to work as consistently as I can. I want to play as much as possible, study as much as possible. And what I did with these games collections was I basically thought there are three main things I want to get from these game collections. First of all, I'm understanding the logic that the best players of all time used to play the moves that they played. So I'm filling my brain up with the logic of the best chess players who ever played that all of it that they published. And so that's a pretty big starting point, and that was one of the five components of chess strength that I laid out in Applying Logic in Chess. So I wanted to get a good grasp on the best logic that the best players had played. I wanted to get a good handle on how they played their best endgames, because in a way, those books are sort of endgame books. You know, Smyslav's best games, Oyve's best games, Alakine's best games. They won a lot of games in beautiful ways. And probably two of two of the games collections that had the biggest impact on me were Kramnik's best games and Anand's best games. And one of the thing about those two books is that people might have thought of Kramnik as kind of more of a quieter or positional player. But from those two books, you actually get a pretty detailed uh, Sicilian, Sicilian repertoire if you want it, because Kramnik was playing the Sveshnikov for a certain period of his career, and Anand was playing a lot of Nidorf. So with those books, I was kind of like, oh, now I already have an opening repertoire. I've seen these typical positions. I've seen how these great players win end games. I've seen the logic they use. That gives you a really good framework to build on. So when people wonder, well, why would you focus so much on those games collections? Essentially, the point was, first of all, there weren't that many to go through. And second of all, I thought that I could power through as many as I saw. And Another one which is kind of underrepresented is Bologan's Best Games. I thought that was a great book. Um, the foreword was written by Kasparov. It's one of the only games collections I've seen Kasparov actually endorse. Hmm. And I thought the explanations of the, the diagram positions and the critical positions in that book were fantastic. So uh, two books that I thought had really good explanations of critical moments were Alakine's Best Games and Bologan's Best Games. 
um, which the, by the Alakine's Best Games version, I mean, is the one that was edited by John Nunn. I think that was a really high quality book and definitely needed to be edited because he really cleaned up a lot of stuff and, and made it made it really good. So that's th- those are those are certainly some books that I would I would think about and and that's the reasoning because I, it could definitely be confusing. You might think to yourself, well, are you sure you just want to focus on games collections so much? It wasn't only that I focused on them, but that was kind of the meat of my main study. The, the meat was what's the thinking that the best players ever used, and I wanna I wanna incorporate that thinking. I want to build my understanding on the thinking of the giants, and that's where I tried to go and. So that that's why I, I place such an emphasis on on game collections. But I do honestly think that that you could power through. I mean, so people might wonder, well, this sounds like an incredible task that you're proposing to go through games collections and this and that. But my point is my point is basically this. If you try to power through certain topics, let's say you want to power through a topic like whether that's let's say you want to power through end games. And you want you want that to be a part of your temporary study. What you can do is you can basically go through, let's say, not let's say you select the ten best endgame books ever written, in your own opinion. And you take these ten endgame books, you could read those all in one year. And imagine that's imagine like I was talking about, you have you have these players who are who are trained by some of these coaches. And let's just take, let's say not an eight-year-old, let's say we're we're talking about a 13-year-old. Someone who's 13 who who wants to stay in chess for a long time. They love chess. It's a lifelong passion. Imagine someone's 13 years old and they're going to play until they're until they're 25 years old or, or 30 years old. So let's say we have a long – that's a lot of time. We, I mean we have 17, 17-ish years. So, I mean, imagine if you spent, if, if you spent one year of your studying to, study time powering through the 10 best endgame books of all time, one year of serious studying, study time maxing out your calculation – you know, doing a thousand very serious positions that you've studied in great depth. And then you max out positional play with, let's say, the five or 10 best positional playbooks. That's three years out of out of 17 years. That's less than one fifth of the time that you're going to play chess. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming if someone's going to be it in the long be in it for the long haul and really loves chess, you know, think about it in the trajectory of a whole chess career. That's that's less than one fifth of somebody's career. And they've already done – they've already basically hit end games, tactics, and positional play and add in one or two years on, on games collections of the best players. You know, there's five years out of 15 or 17. There's one-third of your career. So you could be – so you could basically power from let's say someone was 13 years old or, or let's say someone was 30 years old. By the time they're 35, they could have basically read the bulk of the best chess literature that's available on all those topics. And I think I haven't really seen that perspective proposed, but that that was the angle that I came at it from. And I basically thought, you know, I I want to try to be as effective as I can in all of these areas. I want to hit all these areas. I want to read the best material in all these areas. I want to present my ideas, have them dissected from by basically by the best players and coaches that I possibly could get them dissected by. And if I made mistakes, I'll just correct them. And and I'll try to always focus on best practices and on efficiency, being as efficient as possible. That's I, I really don't want anybody to waste time. And there was a guy who came to me who was he was sixteen fifty. He was sixteen fifty, and he became twenty one fifty in a year and a half. That was probably the fastest development of anyone any adult player I've seen. He was twenty five years old, and you might think of that and think about that and go, wow, that's you know that's that's pretty huge, five hundred points. I mean, someone to go up 500 points in a year and a half, that sounds insane. That doesn't even sound possible. Well, first of all, okay, he may have been underrated at the beginning. So uh, you have to take that into account. May have been underrated by 100 points. But let's let's just be charitable to this and, and say the guy improved 500 points. And you can look him up. His name is Thomas Kalea. Um, he's, uh, he's a player from, from New York. His FIDE rating, I think, was 2150. And, um, but, but anyway, he, he's a... Uh, He's a, a really nice guy. Who, sorry, I was just going to ask how to spell it because, of course, I'm thinking about oh, oh, interviewing him. C A L L E A. Okay, sorry. Go yeah, on. He, he, he's an intro. I mean, he. I, I'm. I, there might be more. There might be people who had who had a faster improvement, but I'm pretty sure it was about a year and a half, and and he had that amazing development. But I'll tell you exactly what he did. So he came to me, and and I basically said, 
do everything that I say. And if you listen to every single thing that I'm proposing, I think you can make really good development if you if you approach it the exact way I did. So one of the things that I suggested is I said, uh, get rid of your um, Pentium 2 laptop and, and get a real desktop. And he got a $2,000 desktop computer, got chess base on it. He started working with the engine and he started basically like I was talking about it before, being able to convert strange engine lines into useful human understanding. He got better and better at building up that understanding. And so basically what he was doing was he was studying like crazy and he found a guy who was about 2150. He was kind of an older player from former USSR and he had been been living in New York and he found a guy who was a little bit over 2100 to play training games with. And so they would play 45 minute training games four or five times per week. And it actually became kind of funny because what happened was, so he basically was playing, let's say, five games per week as a 1650 to 1750 player. And by the way, he was improving extremely rapidly from these games. So he was playing five games per week against this guy, going home, analyzing the games like crazy with the engine, taking them into lessons with me. We did one hour per week. And basically what was happening was, the 2150 guy didn't know what was going on. He's like, how is this guy playing playing so much better? He's he's uh, his, he's refuting my openings. I mean, how is a 1700 guy doing that? Of course, he had an IM helping him. But um, so we identified, you know, weaknesses in this guy's repertoire with white and with black. And so he was really, um, really making it a very impressive head-to-head matchup. And uh, at, at first, he was losing 10-0, 9-1, and then eventually – after about six months, it was something like seven three six four, and he just kept. I mean, here's the thing: most players will never be in a position where they're that lucky that they can have a three hundred to four hundred point higher rated opponent who is willing to play as many training games as they want. So we do have to allow that this is a very special, extreme case of a very motivated individual who had a lot of time to to devote to chess. But basically. This is a best case possible scenario. He had the best tools available. He played as much as possible. He understood those games extremely well. He had a repertoire very well. We, we worked out a narrow repertoire that worked very well for him. He was playing the Benoni. He later played some games against GMs like Brian Smith and some other good players. So he played a lot of good games. He, he played a lot of good games. And, you know, I, I think that he basically took it as seriously or, I mean, he, he took it the most seriously of anyone, of any adult player I've ever seen. And so um, the results are possible. I want people to know that, that the results, like results like that are definitely possible, as, as you can tell from the last guest you had uh, or uh, Megan, you know. So uh, really, the thing is, the thing is, I, I had a bunch of people contact me and say, uh, I had never thought of coming back to chess, but then I read your book and I really thought that it was possible for me to make maybe 2200 or FM or IM. And yeah, that's, that, that's, uh, I'm really happy to hear that because that's, that's exactly what, I mean, that's exactly what I would hope to hear that at least I've inspired some people to think, you know what, a lot of, there's a lot of naysaying about, I can't do this or I can't do that, but I want people to know that we're not talking about being Magnus Carlson. We're talking about reaching achievable goals. So if somebody, you know, if somebody is, let's say, 1900 and they want to make a strong push for 2200 USCF, I think a lot of people, I mean, even in their 50s or 60s can definitely do that. There was a guy who I came across when I was in I was in Bosnia and he um, he he had made some very good improvement. I mean, basically what happened was. He retired and he was studying chess all day and he got to retire in his early 50s. And he went from, I think, 2170 to 2340, something like that. So he became like a stable FM um, from age, let's say, 51 to 54. So it's perfect. I mean, you might say that's not that many points, but yeah, I mean, it's basically going from a 2100 player to a to a FIDE master. So that's that's a pretty big achievement. Sorry, I don't remember the guy's name. No, that's um, okay. But yeah, that but, is a good achievement. Yeah, and, and so I came across that, and I was I was unfortunate enough. You know what? I think I could. I think I can dig up the guy's name. But I I, I I'm pretty sure I I think I played him, or he was on. The, I think I played him in this tournament. And and uh, anyway, but yeah, those those things are are perfectly achievable. It, it's just that, like I said, th- this student of mine, Tommy Kalea, he really focused on 
on maxing out his potential and and working as hard as possible. And because he was so extremely motivated about it, you know, not many people are going to go out and buy a $2,000 computer to to do chess who are, you know, 1700 or so and who had never done that before. And he he really took it extremely seriously and he saw very good results. Unfortunately, he doesn't play chess seriously anymore. Um, I think he stopped playing maybe about a year and a half ago or two years. He got a serious job, basically. And he had he had just finished. Actually, I think he's he was getting a Ph.D. in in psychology. And that's what he was working on. So it was just different things came up in the way. But, you know, the thing is, there's so much potential for these types of things. So I don't I don't like to sound too cliche, but. You, you, I mean, it, you kind of have to, I don't want to say you have to believe in yourself. I want to look at it from the other angle. You shouldn't naysay yourself without really, really compelling evidence. And I basically think, yeah, sure. Why can't I improve 150 or 200 points? Of course I could. I just need to see more examples, understand a little bit more, see a little bit more when I look at a chessboard, have a bit more knowledge, have a bit more experience. And, and of course I can keep improving, especially below a certain rating point. So that, that's that's my complete answer for that. Yeah, I mean, and you need to put in the time. Most importantly, that's obviously the subtext of uh, what what your student did. Um, so, Eric, um, as as you and I know, but we haven't mentioned, and maybe our listeners have heard it, we've had a few technical issues. So, I don't I don't want to go too much longer and push my luck with this. But I do. I know you wanted to talk about uh, chess philanthropy. Um, so, so could you could you tell us a little bit about about how that. Um, how that uh, fits in with your your general career as a chess educator? Yeah, well, I mean, essentially, one of the things that that really um, confused me when I was when I was trying to get better when I came back to chess was I basically thought, all right, I would love to have either somebody to follow or some somebody to just tell me, hey, study these games. Here are five hundred great games you should study. Here are some very good books to study. Here's how to think about this topic, such as evaluating positions like I had in, in applying logic and chess, that chapter. And just to, to give me a kind of, a kind of framework. And so basically from, from a starting point, um, my, my goal in some sense would be to, to, um, spread as much knowledge as possible and give away as much as I could, that could possibly reach as many people as, as possible. But one of them, is uh, well, I, I do have a bunch of uh, a bunch of classic game lists that I put up on chessgames.com, and I can I can link you that. I think that would be just you know just something useful to to have to to look through. And it's one of the things, one of those topics which has always kind of troubled me a little bit, just because um, there was a section I actually you know have really liked Shirashevsky's work. I yeah, liked uh, his his books. I, I liked his Endgame books. Uh, well, from the opening to the end game, books like that, great books on transitioning and and things like that, and some really good um, opening advice and and end game play and everything like that. But one thing was that when he talked about uh, studying the classics, unfortunately, he he isn't that specific. And the thing is, the the method that he proposes, I calculated it out, and it would be about two hundred eighty hours of work. And I thought, you know, that's just too intimidating for probably 98% of people reading. So, uh, so I thought, you know what, if I could put up some, some of these and probably it'll turn into uh, eventually some type of book, you know, something like may- maybe just an ebook, uh, like a chessable book or something like that, like, you know, 400 classic games. And then you, you deeply analyze it with Leela, you know, modern tools, and you try to explain the critical moments and, and uh, put in paragraphs where it's relevant but basically, so so one thing is useful classic games to go through, which I don't know of a great list. There are a couple books. Well, there are a bunch of books like The Most Instructive Games Ever Played. But I would like kind of a more a longer and more complete list, maybe like 500 games, something like, like you know, boom, 15 games, Botvinnik, Alakine, Carlson, you know, the 15 or 20 best players of all time and 15 or 20 of their best games and what to learn from them, like basically – in a sense, a, a little bit like my great predecessors, which were great books. Although, on the one hand, it is a little bit of a daunting task to you know to go through, let's say, five, four hundred fifty or five hundred page books. So that was one thing. Um, I also was giving away. I mean, so I was just talking to a guy yesterday who has a plan to buy, to get a hundred of my uh, of the new book, Chess Logic and Practice. 
and just just give it away, give it away to schools and just just donate it to different chess clubs. So what we did before was we donated books to prisons. I donated 20 of applying logic in chess. And actually, one of the things is that my student, Martin Shkreli, uh, if you Google most hated man in America, that's Martin Shkreli. Uh um, He, uh, you know, uh, the thing is, Martin was uh, he was on a live stream once had 40,000 people watching and he opened up my website and he's like, Eric Kislik. And then for about two weeks, I had people messaging me like, are you the coach of Martin Shkreli? Are you really his coach? Do you actually know him? And I was like, yeah, I, I, I know Martin Shkreli. Um, and uh, on a personal level, he was a, a very nice guy. Um, <laughs> when I've uh, most of the people who I've who I've coached and come across have actually been extremely nice on a on a person to person basis. So it was really a lot of fun coaching him, and he was he was very smart with with the questions he asked. He he wasn't smart with uh, with getting arrested, but he was smart with the questions that he asked me. So one thing he did was he took really difficult tactics that he didn't understand, couldn't conceptualize, and didn't know how to think through, and he would say, "Show me how you think about this position." And that's one of the things that I talk about in applying logic and chess on how to use a coach, because let's put it this way. Uh, it's it's unfortunate that that at the upper tiers of of chess coaching there are coaches who charge 180 bucks or 130 or whatever per hour and it's it it is really expensive to to pay for chess coaching but you know I, I had a student who said uh, there's a there's a 17 year old guy who just made FM he lives nearby what do you think should I take lessons from him I said absolutely you know I I I said we can take a break from lessons I said if she said. He lives down my street. He wants to come over two or three times per week. I said, perfect. So what you can, you know, what you can do is you can have him teach you his approach to chess. And he, he taught a 12 year old girl, basically how he, you know, how he tries to play positions, his tactical style. He had an extremely direct and tactical style. So he was like, all right, in this opening, we're going to try to do this. In this, we're going to try to do this. And he kind of taught her a new, a new philosophy. And so even though it was a 17 year old player who had no, who had never taught before, she was able to get a lot out of it, especially because I kind of pointed towards areas that you could use to to uh, to get something from them. So I think it is really important, just like with Martin Shkreli did with me, with asking questions about positions that totally puzzled him and basically said, give me a thought process. Help me navigate through this this sea of complexity. And I said, OK, yeah, I'll, I, you know, I just laid out how I think through those positions. And, and that was it. So so. Basically, in terms of chess philanthropy, um, you know, free free lists of classic games that at least can give people a starting point, like 400, 500 games, free books to to schools, prisons. I would love to donate as much as possible, even even so, if that meant giving away half of the profits of the book, that would be perfect for me. And the last thing is just through YouTube. I mean, basically, my point would be to have pretty much a f- eventually not yet. I, I just haven't had the time for it, but eventually to have pretty much a free full chess course, you know, just very, the key, key concepts that I focus on in the books, you know, maybe something like 20, 30 videos. And if someone comes across it, they're 1200, 1300. Again, they have a framework to start with for free. You know, it's, it's exactly what I would have wanted when I was getting started in chess. So, you know, free full course. And I have, I have some videos up, like not many, but um, about four or five that can kind of form like a free opening repertoire you know, I have a Bishop G5 Knight or video, Bishop E3 Knight or video, um, Nimzo Indian and Ragazin with black. I have some lines like that. So so basically it's kind of like uh, you, an approach to chess, free opening repertoire and uh, some interviews, obviously not as many as you do, but maybe 10 or 15 interviews with with people that I think are good chess educators or knowledgeable or strong players and then just a little bit of classic games and just fresh game analysis that's of lower priority. But basically, just, again, exactly what I would have wanted in their shoes. So I'm trying to kind of, you know, speak to my old self and, and give my old self back as much as I could have because I would have really appreciated it back then. Awesome. Yeah, and I'll link to the YouTube channel in the show description for anyone wondering. And um, Eric, if, if people want to reach out to you otherwise, what is, what is the best way for them to do that? Um, you know, actually I had a, I had a student who would contact me on like seven different, uh, platforms. And he, one thing he was doing is he was contacting me on YouTube chat and I was like, nobody uses this, huh. but, but he would go, aha, I figured out how to get a hold of you because 
Uh, on Facebook, I have 60 unanswered messages. On email, I have about 600 unanswered messages. I, <laughs> there are just a lot of people when you're on a lot of different things, writing books, coaching people, running camps, running all over the place. There's a lot of stuff going on, and it's really hard to prioritize it. But, but um, email is not bad. Um, you know, unfortunately, I don't have a newsletter or something. But uh, YouTube's pretty good. I mean, I'm, I'm generally pretty good if if somebody's somebody has questions about you know a, a book or a video or something like that. Especially in in future times, maybe if I have interviews with people, then they might want to ask some questions or even propose questions for for a future time. Kind of like kind of like a thing you have here. So cool. I think that that'll be really helpful. Excellent. Well, I will uh, I will link to to all that stuff, Eric. And thanks for bearing with me through uh, yet again technical issues on my end. Sorry about that. But this is this has been really ex- insightful. So I appreciate being you're being so generous with your time. Sure, I'm I'm happy to uh, really go into any topic. I mean, there's not much that really excites me as much as talking about chess in great detail. I just I, I've always loved how logical the game is, and that's why I wrote the book Applying Logic in Chess and Chess Logic in Practice. Cool. Yeah. And of course, I'll link to those as well in the show description. And by the time this comes out, I saw yesterday uh, the, the new one. Amazon said it was available, but sold out or something like that. And I, I'm, I'm waiting for the Kindle version, which will be out uh, in August, I believe. Yeah, in um, August. Cool. Well, Eric, thanks again. This has been a lot of fun. All right. Well, thanks for your time. I, I really enjoyed uh, the conversation, sharing my views, and I uh, hope to get to talk to you soon. Sounds good, Eric. Thanks. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Of course, that includes my producer, Matthew Passy, and Geert Vandervelt. Thanks for supplying the theme music gear. I also want to thank everyone who helps spread the word about the show, whether it be by writing a positive review on Apple Podcasts or another platform, by telling a friend, by stopping a stranger on the street, social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Praising Perpetual Chess on all those things is helpful as well. But of course, most of all, I want to thank the people who helped support the show financially. Without you guys, Perpetual Chess would not be possible. I want to give extra special thanks to the following people and entities. Chessable.com, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Apprentice Twitch Channel, Andrew Bach, Austin Clough, Benjamin Handelman, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, Dan O'Hanlon, I am Dimitri Schneider, Faraz Sawaf, Greg Shahadi, Guven Manet, Jens Green, John Jernigan, John Cromarty, Kelly Palmer, Lone Pine Chess, the Law Offices of Stuart Katz, the Seattle Chess Club, Sidney Andrews, Thomas Tachenko, and Todd Bryant. I also would like to give thanks to my Patreon and PayPal Perpetual Partners. They include, here comes the list. Andrew Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Terakov, Benjamin Handelman, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brett Zeldo, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Chris Balcom, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, David Kofer, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsburg, Dan Lucas of uschess.org, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, I am Alec Donnie Ariel, Fox Valley Chess Club of Aurora, Illinois, Frank Tortoris, MD, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barto, Giovanni Russo, Greg Natal, Han Schutt, Harish Srinivasan, James Banastia, Jason Willem, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, J.J. Stranod, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Jerry Wells, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, Kare Christensen, WGM Katerina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kavutsky, Krishna Gapala Krishnan, Laura Belyavsky, Lucio Casada Silva, Martin Knudsen, Matthew Passi, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Miguel Araspide, my main man Moonmaster9000, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passan, and Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Robert Steiner, Ryan Berg, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Steiner Lima, WGM Tati of Abrahamian, Thomas Stanix, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Vrancouz, 
William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Chang of Chess1000.com, and last but not least, Zhivko Storyanov. Thanks, everyone, and I will catch you all next week. Thank you.